Hi, I'm Adrian Saville. I'm visiting professor at the Gordon Institute of Business Science. The economy puts us in tough times. We find ourselves in an economic landscape of 0% economic growth and constant talk of recession. And in the time that we've got together, I'd like to explore two questions with you. The first is, why does the economy matter so much to business performance? And the second, arguably the more practical, is what can we do about it if we find ourselves in tough economic times? So the first question of why does the economy matter so much is uh, illustrated quite neatly by uh, the evidence that I show you here, the relationship between company earnings and their net worth. If the question that we're asking or interrogating, how can I make my business worth more tomorrow than it is today? The answer comes to us very quickly and readily in the form of underlying earnings. The relationship that you see here is for the Johannesburg Stock Exchange All Share Index. This is the 160 largest companies listed on the JSE. And it shows you the relationship over a long period of time, the best part of 20 years, between underlying earnings and the net worth of businesses. The investment guru Warren Buffett put this very simply when he said in the short run, markets are voting machines. In the long run, they're weighing machines. And the suggestion from this evidence is that what markets are ultimately weighing is the ability of businesses to generate and sustain earnings. This is a single powerful relationship that causes our businesses to be worth more tomorrow than they are today. And so in a business school environment, this then begs the question, well, if it's earnings that matter so much, what can we do to promote and sustain elevated earnings? There's lots of arguments that are, uh, immediately present themselves or lots of ideas that immediately present themselves. Strong leadership, powerful brand, dominant market share, effective distribution, networks, and so on. And I would venture that every single one of these matters. However, from evidence that we draw from studying 25 countries over a 15-year period, what we find in country after country, economy after economy, is that the single biggest determinant, the single biggest influence on company earnings is the economy. You might recall Bill Clinton's election ticket of 20 years ago. It's the economy, stupid. And whilst that got Clinton elected, it's also what gets to drive business earnings. So the data that I show you here is for the South African economy, and it shows you the performance of the South African economy in the dark column. And the red line is year-on-year -year change in company earnings after inflation. We must show this after inflation because, of course, you can't eat inflation. Inflation eats you. And so what we're interested in here is real economic growth and real company earnings, to use uh, the textbook language. And the relationship here is fairly powerful. The uh, suggestion is that about two thirds of the variability in year on year company earnings is explained by economic growth. And whilst the data I show you here is for South Africa, uh, it's important to note that in the other countries that we've surveyed, in total a set of 25 countries, in every single country, we find that the most important explainer of year to year change in underlying company earnings is the economy. Clinton had it right. So if the economy matters so much, and if you were given to choose uh, the chance to choose an ingredient, my suggestion uh, to you, in fact, my argument to you would be unambiguously, without question, choose strong economic growth. The economy matters. And the conversation quickly then becomes depressing because right now, as I suggested at the outset, we found ourselves in a directionless economic environment where the talk is of zero economic growth and flirtation with recession. And so if we are in tough economic times, we can find the relationship then between the economy and company earnings. And from the data that I show you here, an economic growth rate for 2016 of probably zero to half a percent corresponds with company earnings growth that are in recession. Most businesses in South Africa in 2016 are wrestling with falling earnings, and that's explained by the economic environment. 
So if the economy has got us in tough times, uh, Mike Tyson might not be the obvious place to go for business wisdom, but he makes the short, powerful point that everyone, every business has a plan till they get punched in the mouth. And the punch in the mouth in this uh, environment is this sluggish economic growth that is pulling earnings down. What I would refer to as the gravitational pull of the economy on earnings. And for many businesses, this proves uh, hard to, to escape. So I'm going to give you a chance to go back to the barrel and reach for a second ingredient to now uh, build a capability, a capacity to deal with this slow economic growth. And it's here that you might want to go back for those first ingredients that I suggested, those ingredients of leadership network effects, uh, economies of scope, economies of scale, strong brand. Uh, now that it's given that the economy is so powerful and we can't choose a strong economy, that's given to us. Now what will you choose to cope with tough economic times? And I'm going to stay with the boxing analogy and my suggestion to you is choose a boxer. Choose Muhammad Ali. Why I suggest Ali is because the evidence from the arena and uh, sporting uh, arenas give us so many powerful business analogies. The evidence from the arena is Ali is arguably one of the most impressive competitive strategists of modern business and sporting history. Aside to be, uh, from being a very powerful strategist, he's also a great comedian and he tells uh, Roy Jones, for instance, who he sparred with uh, in the 1960s and 1970s, after sparring with Roy Jones, he says to Roy Jones, I've got some advice for you, get a gun. And he tells George Foreman, ahead of the famous rumble in the jungle, that uh, I'll hit you so many times you think you're surrounded. So here, not only does he bring us wonderful insights into strategy, he also brings a sense of humor, which perhaps is a helpful reminder in all times of our humanness. But what Ali does uh, in the arena converts into competitive strategy outside of the arena. And to give substance to my observation around Ali, let me show you again some evidence from the business landscape. The first piece of evidence comes from work done by the Columbia Business School professor Rita McGrath. And what she surveys is the performance of almost 5,000 companies and these are companies of size. They're businesses with market cap of a billion dollars or more. So they're established businesses. Uh, they have size, they have reputation, they have heft. And what uh, Rita McGrath interrogates is the question, how many of these 5,000 businesses are able to sustain uninterrupted earnings growth five years in a row? That was her first survey period. From the data in the table here, I'll steer you to the middle uh, row, which is the 2005 to 2009 period. And that was her first survey period. She was stunned that only 8% of businesses were able to sustain top line growth ahead of inflation and only 4% could sustain five years of bottom, bottom line growth ahead of inflation. Those numbers stunned, surprised Rita McGrath. And her immediate response to that very low hit rate was that, well, it's the economy. Back to our earlier point. And that led her to survey a different period, a period in which the economy was more generous and more forgiving. And that was the naughty to 04 period. In that naughty to 04 period, the data here uh, shows us indeed that turnover growth and earnings growth without interruption do enjoy a higher incidence, that now 15% and 7% of the companies can grow top line and bottom line without interruption. But still, it's a remarkably small number. And that led Rita McGrath to a third, and I would venture, intriguing question. Well, are these businesses that do five years in a row without interruption in the 2000 to 2004 period, the same companies that do uninterrupted earnings and turnover growth in the 2005 to 2009 period. In short, are there any businesses in our 5,000 company sample that do 10 years in a row without interruption, growing turnover and growing earnings? 
The answer is yes, 10 of them. And this number in short is staggering. That of 5,000 businesses surveyed, only 10 do 10 years in a row top line growth and bottom line growth without interruption. Those companies are listed here. The Indian systems business Infosys, not Google, not Yahoo, Yahoo Japan. The Indian bank HDFC, a Spanish construction firm. Spain is going through deep economic turmoil, yet there's a Spanish construction firm, an industry that relies heavily on economic performance. There's a Spanish construction firm that does 10 years in a row uninterrupted top line and bottom line growth. Kirka, a East European pharmaceuticals business, and Atmos Energy, a 100-year-old energy business out of the United States. What's fascinating about this list of 10 companies is not only uh, is it just 10 businesses, but they appear to have nothing in common when it comes to industry, size, ownership structure, leadership style, and so on. And that result led us to survey South African businesses, and we came up with an equally fascinating result. That first, as the results show you here, regardless of our start year, whether we start measuring performance in 1997, 1998, or 2003, regardless of our start year, it is difficult to sustain growth. That sustained performance is overwhelmingly a minority sport. But second, that the champions in the South African environment, the Ali's of competitive strategy, are not evidently the usual suspects. And here I list our South African superstars, what we call agile absorbers, and I'll explain this in a moment. These businesses that not just survive but thrive through variable, varying economic conditions are overwhelmingly off-radar companies, just like Rita McGrath's outliers, our South African thrivers and survivors are off-radar businesses. Uh, EOH, Enterprise Outsource Holdings, Clientel Life, a small packaging business that isn't spoken about, Bola Metcalf, and then, just like Rita McGrath's results, a South African construction firm, Wilson Bailey Homes Ofcon. And if these attributes start to look similar, then perhaps there is something in the similarity. And so it's here that we can circle back to the reference to Ali. Because when Rita McGrath rolls up her sleeves and digs into these businesses and goes in search of what are the common attributes, she finds the exact same ingredients that we find in these South African businesses that are able to navigate and negotiate tough economic times, plus 6% growth uh, that we achieved in the mid noughties and economic recession that we achieved in the late 90s and are flirting with now. Through these changing and highly variable circumstances, these businesses are somehow able to produce and sustain uninterrupted top line and bottom line growth. The two common ingredients that they have is in business after business, they display agility. Muhammad Ali has this when he talks about floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. And just to be clear, agility is not going fast. Agility is the ability to choose your speed. But that speed comes in three flavors or forms. Operational agility, which is we do things well, we do things efficiently. It takes most airlines about 80 minutes to turn around a plane. Southwest Airlines turns a plane around in 20 minutes. Why is this so important? Because Herb Kelleher, the CEO of Southwest Airlines, says the only time an airplane makes money is when it's up in the air. Let's get it up in the air. Portfolio agility is the company name is the same at the top, yet the businesses underneath that company are constantly changing form, shape and flavor. And a business like Enterprise Outsource Holdings or Mr. Price are wonderful South African examples of that. And the third attribute of agility is strategic agility. And strategic agility is not so much figuring out what the future looks like because Tyson reminds us that we will get punched in the face if we are certain we know exactly what tomorrow looks like. Rather, strategic agility is the ability to move so quickly that the competition is stunned by your speed and your 
uh, uh, ability to be at the market um, before others can get there. And then the second attribute that Ali brings to every fight is absorption. He's perhaps best known for his rope-a-dope strategy, which he displayed in the Rumble in the Jungle. This was the famous fight with uh, George Foreman in Zaire in the early 1970s. And boxing says don't go to the ropes, yet Ali went to the ropes. And in going to the ropes, he built incredible absorptive capability. He built an ability to withstand punches from foremen. And this can be punches from your competition. It can be punches from the economy. And he withstood those punches for eight rounds before coming off the ropes and throwing the knockout punch and recapturing his world heavyweight title. This is the language and the behavior of competitive champions, competitive strategists. Absorption, just like agility, comes in lots of shapes and flavors. It comes with the shape of a war chest, that you have kept some ammunition dry, knowing that tough times will come, that you have diversified cash flow, that you might work in multiple industries, that you might be working in multiple geographies, that there are intangible assets that every business can build. That intangible asset is called goodwill and brand. And these are some of the attributes of these so-called agile absorbers. On this next slide, I've tried to convert this from idea into practice, that we are not just now talking about being Ali and talking about agile and absorptive, but we're actually converting this into business practice. What these agile absorbers do, both the South African businesses and the global outliers, they're constantly taking small bets. They have good controls installed in their business. They're constantly innovating at every level. They are bottom-up businesses that whilst they may well go on bosporats to come back with great ideas, they are getting as much business wisdom, business intelligence from the coalface by being bottom-up businesses. That they are shrewd capital allocators that they don't have an affinity for big bets. And when they bet, they often bet on themselves because no business is better understood than their own firm. That they aren't obsessed with growth, that they do pursue growth, but they are as comfortable shrinking as they are growing. And that they have federal structures, which means they encourage the attributes of ownership and risk-taking. But those attributes of ownership and risk-taking in the Federation are reported back to uh, a business that has uh, strong central controls and whose central controls support uh, speed and flexibility. The result is elevated margin, it's uninterrupted earnings growth, and it's uninterrupted earnings growth not just in good times, but in tough times too, as we find ourselves. In finishing, uh, I would remind you then that whilst we are talking about competitive strategy for tough economic times, this is talk. And that if we want to design impressive strategy, here's your magnetic fridge poetry. And it would say something like, we should create a next generation capability to innovate with excellence. And those are the wonderful words that fill a uh, glossy print. But why I make this point is if I animate this slide, captured in here, embedded in here, are Kodak's words. Kodak's competitive strategy. Kodak said that they would build a world-class results-oriented culture that would bring differentiated solutions with energy. And of course, you know where that got Kodak, into bankruptcy court. So while strategy makes for impressive reading, uh, strategy is only effective if we do three things. Action, action, and action. And James Lovell, this is the commander of the Apollo 13. He brought the Apollo 13 back from the dark side of the moon. He reminds us that there are three types of people. Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. Interestingly, agile absorbers are all three of those in their actions. They are curious. They watch things happen. They are innovative. They wonder what would happen if, and then they are action-oriented. They roll up their sleeves and they make things happen.